Well, here we are at the last day of 2020, a day many have looked forward to with great anticipation. Let me tell you, there will be times in 2021 when you may look back at 2020 and say, oh, those were the good old days. <laughs> now, that's not a prophetic word. That's just a word of caution. But uh, God has good things in store. God has revival in store. God has his Holy Spirit in store. His Spirit is here and being poured out increasingly as we move into this new year. So in this new year, there'll be some hard times, but there'll also be the times that we have looked forward to and prayed for for many, many years as we see the Holy Spirit moving in unprecedented ways. So my message this morning, I want to just, uh, you know, the whole, all day today we're going to be looking prophetically at, at the new year. And I don't know what all the others are going to say, so maybe they'll say something completely different, but I don't think so. But this morning, I wanted to, the message is starting the year off right, 2021, a year of war and triumph, or putting on the strength of God. Tell your neighbor, God wants you to be clothed with strength this year. He wants you to be dressed for conquest this year. Now, we're here this week to celebrate the beginning of a new year. We're still in the Hebrew year, 5781, but we're just beginning the Roman year, 2021. Now, it's good to begin every year by hearing what God is saying about it. Revelation 2.7 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches. See, the Holy Spirit is speaking. He's speaking through his prophets. And 2 Chronicles 20, 20 says, if we pay attention to his prophets, we will prosper. And so we've come here today, we've gathered here today on the internet to receive prophetic direction for the new year. Now, one of the ways God speaks prophetically is through his calendar. We're just beginning a new year in the Roman calendar. By this time tomorrow, we will be in 2021. But in the Hebrew calendar, we'll still be in the year 5781. And to the Jews, every year is a new prophetic season. The Jews believe that God speaks prophetically through the Hebraic calendar to give us direction for the season ahead. And in Hebrew, 5781 is not written in numbers, it's written in Hebrew letters. And Hebrew letters don't just have a sound, they each have a meaning. So what does 5781 mean? 5781, you can take the letters of that and interpret it as may it be the year of, the number 80 is the Hebrew letter pay. And the number one is the Hebrew letter Aleph. So 5781 in Hebrew is the year of Pei and Aleph. Now at our head of the year conference back in September, we looked at the letter Pei. We are in a Pei season. Every year in this decade will be a Pei year. So let's review briefly some of the things we saw about that letter. The letter Pei means mouth. The earliest pictograph of the letter pay looks like this. It was a picture of a mouth. Pay words include speech, word, vocalization. Pay also pictures a face. The word for face in Hebrew is panim. It's a pay word. And it's one of, really one of the most important words in the Bible. In Hebrew, your face represents you. To do something before your face is to do it in your presence. And God's face also represents God's presence. 
Now, if you understand that God's face represents his presence, that will help you understand some things in the Bible. You know, in Israel's priestly blessing in Numbers chapter 6, mentions the face of God. That when the priest is to, bl to bless the people, he is supposed to say this, may the Lord make his face shine on you. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean for God's face to shine on you? Well, you know, when you see someone you love, your face brightens. It's a visible change. Your countenance shines on them. And when your face brightens, that means I am so happy to see you. You know, there's a room, big room down at the airport called International Arrivals. And we've been there many times to meet people coming in from overseas. But it's a big room and it's full of people who are all waiting for a loved one to get home from many weeks away. And they're all sitting around with their eyes glued to the door where people are coming through customs out into the United States. And they're sitting there and they're watching that door. And when their loved ones comes through that door, you can see their face light up. They run to them. There's often an embrace. That's what it's like when you see someone that you love so much. They make your face shine. And see, the devil has told some of you, God does not like you. You know, that is a lie from the devil. The Bible says God loves you so much, you make his face light up. He's happy to spend time with you. He wants to show you his love. Did you know that it makes God happy when you choose to spend time with him? He loves you so much. You know, Zephaniah 317 says God takes great delight in you. And then it says he rejoices over you with singing. Have you ever thought about God looking at you and just singing love songs to you because he loves you so much? When you seek him, his face shines. And that's why God told the high priest to pray, may your face shine on your people and shower them with your grace. Another common phrase is to seek God's face. To seek his face means to seek his manifest presence. You know, we're always in the presence of God, but sometimes we're in his manifest presence. That's when you get so close to him that his, his presence becomes tangible. You can feel his presence with you. And see, God wants you to seek his face this year. He wants to be face to face with you. And as you seek his face, he will meet with you so you can experience his blessing and the overwhelming joy of his presence. Now we saw at our head of the year conference that a pay season is also a season of visitation. Visit and visitation are pay words. Now many people think of visitation as a wonderful time when God's presence and power are manifested and we just lay there on the floor enjoying God. But there's another kind of visitation. Visitation can also be when God visits the world with judgment. So there are two kinds of visitation. When a society turns decisively away from God, there comes a point when he lifts his hand of protection and there's a visitation of judgment. I think we've seen both kinds of visitation this year. In 2020, we saw wave after wave of disaster, unprecedented disasters, sweep the world. Last January, we viewed horrific images of fires sweeping Australia. Every major city in Australia was surrounded by fire. Later in the year, we saw the same thing in parts of the United States. And then in February, there were reports of unprecedented locust swarms in Africa, the Middle East, and in Asia. Locusts darkened the sky in Africa. They stripped fields bare within minutes. They left famine in their wake. And then they moved through the Middle East and ate their way into China. Now, in the Bible, locusts are always a sign of God's judgment. 
Then there came the coronavirus. Anybody ever hear about that? It began in one small area of China, and then it just spread everywhere. Nations are in quarantine, businesses are closed, travel is canceled, the economy is in shambles, many people are living in fear. But then in the wake of the pandemic, waves of violence swept the United States. Major cities became war zones. It seemed like the whole world had gone insane. And so in one year, we have wave after wave after wave of catastrophes worldwide. And I believe these are an evidence of a society under judgment. God does not enjoy judgment. That's never his first choice. But he will allow catastrophes to come to motivate people to repent and turn back to him. We see that the whole way through the Bible. But in the midst of catastrophes, a different kind of visitation was taking place this year. In this year of visitation, God is also visiting us with his Holy Spirit. We saw a new Jesus movement birth on the beaches of California. I love the headlines. Two to three thousand gathered to raise their voice on Pismo Beach. California Beach Revival draws hundreds to Christ, likened to the Jesus People Movement. I love this. When the church has left the building, the L.A. Times declares revival happening at the ocean's edge in Huntington Beach. When indoor church services were banned, mass praise gatherings broke out in Los Angeles. And though the media would not cover it, 12,000 gathered to praise Jesus at the California State Capitol. The event was marked by many salvations and healings. In many cities, riots paved the way for revival. In Minneapolis, headlined baptisms and miracles taking place in revival at the site where George Floyd died. In Kenosha, Wisconsin, the headlines read, Replacing Riots with Revival, Christian Movement Brings Baptism and Worship to the Streets of Kenosha. See, we are in a season of the Holy Spirit. Yes, there's judgment, but there's also grace. We saw last September the pay words include the words to blow or to puff, and especially for kindling a fire. And see, the Holy Spirit wants to kindle fresh fire in you as we move into this year. He wants to kindle his fire in our land. And for those watching from other countries, he wants to kindle his fire in your land. So welcome the Holy Spirit's fire. <laughs> Pay words also include the words for a miracle or a wondrous thing. So this is a season for signs, wonders, and miracles. Now we are going to be in a pay season all through this decade. So get ready for miracles. So the first letter associated with this whole season is pay, but the primary letter associated with this year is the letter Aleph. In 2021, we are in an Aleph season. Now, what does the Aleph mean? Well, Aleph is the Hebrew number one. It's the first letter in the alphabet. It's called the father of the alphabet. This is very interesting. It is a silent letter, but it's a symbol of strength. The original pictograph of the letter Aleph was a picture of a bull or an ox. And over the years, they gradually changed the way they wrote it until it came to be drawn the way we have it today. But a bull or an ox was a symbol of strength. It was the strongest animal the ancient Israelites knew. And so that became the meaning of Aleph. Aleph means strength. Aleph words include strong, mighty, valiant, magnificent. Most of the strong names of God are Aleph words, Adonai, which means Lord, El and Elohim, the strong one, El Elyon, the most high God, El Shaddai, God Almighty, 
El Gibor, the mighty God. Elah, the awesome God. And so the year of Aleph is a year to know the strength of God. And that's important <coughs> because we're entering into a season of war. You know, many Aleph words are warfare words. Destruction, enemy, terror, treachery, ambush, rebellion, to grapple, to wrestle, citadel, stronghold, power, strength, and take possession. So don't be surprised if you find yourself at war this year. You know, when Chuck sent out the email for this conference, I looked at it and it says, starting the year off right, 2021, a year of war and triumph. And the email said, it, this conference will be a time to worship, to gain strategy, and receive an anointing so you war in triumph into your future. So the prophets are saying, we're in a war season. Now, there will be conflicts in the natural realm, but the truly decisive battles will take place in the spiritual realm. And in this time of warfare, God wants to give us the keys to triumph over the enemy. He doesn't want you to just war. He wants you to win. Now, in this Aleph year, God wants us to prepare for war. He wants us to receive his strength so we're able to triumph in the war. Now, why is there war? Well, we're at war because we have an enemy. Some people say, oh, I don't like that spiritual warfare stuff. I don't like to talk about that. Well, the fact is we have an enemy. His name is Satan, and he has declared war on us. Revelation calls him the dragon. He's an evil tyrant, and this world is his territory. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 calls Satan the god of this world. 1 John says the whole world lies in his power. Jesus said Satan comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. And that's why the world is such a mess. Some people say, well, oh, if God is a good God, why is the world in such a mess? It's because the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. Satan always works to bring pain and hatred and poverty and justice, sickness and death. But Satan has a powerful enemy in the earth. And Satan's mortal enemy is the bride. You know, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to set right all creation to conquer sin and sickness and death. During his time on earth, a third of his ministry involved direct confrontation with Satan's uh, forces. And then when he ascended into heaven, Jesus entrusted the continuation of that battle to his bride. He was saying, in effect, I have a new way to defeat the devil. I'm going to send my wife. His bride is the church, and that's you. Tell your neighbor, that's you. But that means you're in a battle. Ephesians 6, 12 says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Struggle in Greek is pale. In Hebrew, it's an aleph word. It means hand-to-hand -hand combat. Ephesians 6 says, our combat is against principalities, authorities, rulers, and spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. See, Satan hates everything God loves. 